Thank you so much for coming. It's, uh, it's really exciting, isn't it? Uh, today I'll talk about how, uh, how we, we started working on, on, on various elements of research computing to enable uh, hybrid, right? So today we have excellent speakers. Paul, he comes from CRC Canada, and they're using uh, AWS for, for various scientific workflows that uses radio frequency. I'm not going to tell details. You'll hear from him. Amy, she's, she comes from uh, Clemson. And with Amy, we work together on something called natural language processing, uh, where the way people talk, the topics are modeled. I'll, I'll show some slides, but she'll give you detailed how they studied uh, natural language processing using AWS. And do you know they create the largest HPC cluster in the planet during that time, and just using one AWS region. So she'll tell you the story. The third is Gavin. Gavin is from Wharton School, and they, uses, they used one of their batch system, it's called Univa, and they modified the system such that uh, the researchers can directly you know, uh, uh, expand to AWS and get their jobs done. So we'll hear that part of the story as well. So let me tell you one story which is very dear to me. I came from Large Hadron Collider. That's, that's, that's a, let's see, it's, it's at CERN. Uh, in, it's in Switzerland. Uh, it's about 18 mile instrument. It's under the ground. Half of them is in Switzerland, half of them is France. And uh, here is me with my colleagues. That's a CMS detector. It's one of the small component of the detector. The, the community is more than 6,000 people uh, from 40 countries and they produce more than 25 petabyte of data each year. It's humongous, right? The, this is one of the detector, and that, that person you see, that's the size of a human. And it takes, if, if, I, if I look at it, if you have an 80 million pixel, it, it collides particles roughly about 25 nanosecond. So if you take 80 million uh, electronic channel, multiply by two, it's roughly about in times 40 hertz, it's 10 petabyte of information per second. It's huge, right? How do we use those? So the way we try to do that there is we, we reduce the data size in something called triggers. So that means we all do online processing using FPGAs. And then we, we send that to 10 different countries and each country is responsible for processing it. And one of the countries is the US. So we worked with Fermilab to understand these kind of studies, where what we did is we took their batch system, and that's actually Condor based, and we tried to do what we call uh, elastically expanding the, their batch system to, to AWS. So whenever they are trying to do some kind of a Monte Carlo simulation or digitization process, if their system is full, you know, they're using their own system, right? But if there are more data collected and, and more work to, uh, need to be done, it automatically expands to AWS and shrinks back. So what is beautiful is they started using, they started using, oh, I'm sorry, this pointer. So what is beautiful about that is, as soon as they put things in the scheduler, they created roughly about 60,000 slots. And the beauty part, part of that is the ups and downs, right? So whenever there is a job in the scheduler, it gets done. It, it expands to AWS, gets processed. But when there is no job, it shrinks back. So this way they can do roughly about 60,000 uh, instances using AWS spot. And then you shrink back to the original capacity when you don't need it. That, that was a beautiful illustration. Uh, so this way they created a factor of five formula. Within, within a few weeks, right? So the next study we try, and that particular process, how to do that, is actually in the marketplace. We call HD Condor Annex, it's free, it's funded by National Science Foundation, and one can use it uh, anytime. And any user can, can, should be able to do that. Similarly, with Amy's uh, study, uh, we try to do what we call topic modeling using NIPS data, and we categorized into various topics. And there we created, if you look at this particular plot, there we created roughly 1.1 million CPUs over a weekend. And they got it done in two hours. That would have taken like years on a traditional set of computers, right? That was a beautiful study It was done. The next part I want to say is 
this natural language processing, it's, it's really sometimes a bit complicated, right? Because it's, it's, it's difficult to do it. With AWS, we try to work into a way such that we can make it machine learning e easy. Typically, machine learning happens in three ways, right? One is most of the things, but when you say analytics and all that, those are supervised learning. That's well known, but there are unsupervised learning and there are also reinforcement learning where you try to give a, a award system for the system to learn. In order to make it easier for uh, people, we, we provide a platform, uh, uh, a, 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 a platform called uh, Amazon SageMaker. And that has the most top 10 algorithms built into the system like k-mean clustering, linear regression, so on and so forth. It also supports deep learning frameworks like uh, CAFE, Tino, TensorFlow, MXNet. The way it, uh, SageMaker works is that it comes under what we call platform services and underneath you have various learning AMIs like CAFE and Tino, the things I talked about, and that runs in our platform, right? That's EC2 or Internet of Things, or, or you can do the same, similar kind of thing with the edge computing. It's pretty easy to do. So do, to do a machine learning, you have a couple of cycles, right? You define your own Jupyter notebook or your own code. You have interface built in such that you can tune your hyperparameter or what we call error functions, and then you deploy it. So these three phases are well modeled into that. It's, it's really fast, it's scalable, it's distributed, uh, and, and, and it, it works for you in, in many ways. You have uh, Amazon optimized algorithms. You have Apache Spark's uh, estimators. Uh, or if, if some algorithm is missing, of course you can bring it off your own. It also uh, has an interface, I'm so sorry, uh, it also have an interface directly with elastic clusters of CPUs and GPUs to do training or, 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 uh, or uh, inference. Most of the uh, in inference we have seen, it is done in, in, in Intel uh, CPUs or, or sometimes FPGAs. So it basically makes you easier to build, train, and deploy. So many of these machine learning technologies people are using for various studies. And some of the studies will hear from it uh, today, but uh, with that I introduce the next speaker, uh, Paul, he's from CRC Canada. Thank you. And good morning, everybody. As uh, Sanjay said, I'm from the Communications Research Center Canada. Um, a little bit about us. We are the federal lab whose mandate is to research tools and techniques for wireless spectrum usage in Canada. And we report to the Canadian Spectrum Regulator. We're very much an applied research center. And the reason we exist is because today, wireless, is, wireless services underpin our modern economy and our modern lifestyle. We totally rely upon our cell phones, our GPS, our Wi-Fi, our emergency services dispatch system, our air traffic control, and on and on and on it goes. The demand is increasing constantly. But Spectrum is a finite resource. So how do you manage it better? To answer that question, uh, we arrange our research around three what we call grand challenges. So very briefly, the first one is to survey the resources. We built a cloud-based framework to ingest spectrum measurement data, perform analytics, and a visualization function. So we get an idea of what's going on. You can't see spectrum, you can't taste it, you can't feel it. A sister grand challenge is simply making better use of that spectrum. What are the tools, techniques, and rules that we can apply to new radio systems? They will interoperate more efficiently with each other and with legacy systems. And the last one is uh, breaking the frequency barrier to increase the supply. And this grand challenge addresses the notion, and certainly for mobile broadband applications, all the spectrum that's been made available today is below six gigahertz. And that's because the propagation characteristics of wireless below particularly two gigahertz is, is favorable. And we see that with our cell phones today. We generally get good in-building coverage, uh, ubiquitous coverage. When you go above six gigahertz, that's no longer the case. And in the case of the uh, 5G wireless, which is about to come upon us, the amount of spectrum 5G services require I mean, they have to be above six gigahertz simply to get the spectrum they need. How do we make that happen in a reasonable way? And that's what I want to talk a bit about today. Our three grand challenges, we, uh, together we simply call it 
sustainable spectrum management. So as I mentioned, uh, to, for, to manage the environment for a high frequency um, uh, radio propagation, how do we do that? Traditionally, we'd use infill techniques. So where there's no coverage, you add another base station. Where there's no coverage, you add another base station. But with these very short propagation distances, it becomes untenable, uh, economically untenable, not to mention untidy. So in, in uh, collaboration with the National Research Council of Canada, and GGI uh, Solutions of Montreal, we have invented technology we call engineered surfaces. So what you're looking at here is a mylar sheet on which is printed a set of patterns printed in a conductive ink. When you send a wireless signal against this surface, it can be designed to do a number of different things. It can bounce back frequencies of interest. It can filter out frequencies you want filtered. It can focus frequencies. And we're printing on mylar or paper, or concrete, or glass. So we can have this low cost, easy to deploy uh, surface, which you can integrate into the built environment to engineer the surface to get the wireless coverage where you need it. It's a great technology. Let me give you one simple e example. Um, here is the, an aerial view of the Ottawa City Hall complex. We put in a base station operating at 28 gigahertz. It's well above the six gigahertz sweet spot. And we did a coverage analysis, and you can see in the top right, there was no coverage in that courtyard. So we introduced two engineered services, surfaces on small billboards to bounce the signal into that courtyard and provide coverage. And this worked, and we know it did because we set up an experiment and we had a researcher walking around with a prototype backpack, streaming back video in real time in an un uninterrupted way as he walked around the environs of City Hall. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. So engineered services have great applications, but they are challenging to design. So traditionally, we've been using more antenna types of techniques, those straight line examples you saw earlier. But that's somewhat limiting uh, in order, if you wish to design very novel types of surfaces. Moreover, the traditional design technique is very iterative. So our researchers will use their theory to come up with a potential design. They will simulate it to see if it works. If it doesn't, they'll iterate, they'll try again, and, it, and so on. So we said, well, how about if we, to, to avoid that limitation of capabilities, we move away from the idea of lines, but rather we'll treat each of those cells on the engineered surface as a 41 by 41 pixel array, and it can therefore do whatever it needs to do to, to meet the uh, requirement. However, with a 41 by 41 pixel array, we have a rather a lot of designs, 10 to the 70. To put that in context, the number of atoms in the atmosphere is around 10 to the 47, and the estimated number of atoms in the universe is 10 to the 80. So clearly, brute force techniques are not going to work. So we adopted a genetic algorithm where we evolve our patterns to the best design. So we start with a candidate population of what they think might be a good uh, patterns. We apply a natural selection function choose the best, mutate to create a new population, and then rinse and repeat until we converge on a best solution. Now, uh, and so evolve to the very best design. So for this search for engineer, uh, engineered surfaces, I, I, I said we have this population of potentially 10 to the 70. We decided to focus on just 1,000. But that natural selection function I just mentioned in passing is actually the hard part. We have these objective functions that we're trying to achieve, but in order to, to find out whether any given pattern would meet that function, we use a rather expensive, complex, and computationally demanding piece of commercial off-the-shelf software. And that has always traditionally been our limiting factor. It's very expensive. We only have one or two licenses. Could we then increase the number of licenses and apply parallelism to the problem? So, uh, to see if we could do the evaluations and comparisons on multiple different patterns at once. So, we, we negotiated with the supplier and said, we want, we want more licenses for a short period of time for a, a reasonable cost. Can you help us? And after some negotiation, we went from a couple licenses to a thousand licenses in, uh, for three days, just three days to see what we could do. So, we created what we call a six-week challenge. And in six weeks, the challenge to our researchers 
was to see, could you use genetic algorithms, design engineered surfaces using, and I'm now going to call it baby HPC. Compared to my fellow panelists, we, we're just taking very baby steps in the world of HPC. So hopefully this is encouraging for those of you who, who want to go there and haven't gone there yet. This is one way you could approach it. So we took a team of, of uh, researchers, um, and if you were in the previous session, multidisciplinary. We had radio guys, we had uh, computer science guys, we had IT people, and together they created this genetic algorithm master node. And they set it up so they would set up a, a common file system, start these worker nodes, which would then pick up the source code they need, so they're all running the same stuff, pick up a license for this software, and then they would um, look, look into the, uh, the uh, common file system to see the first generation, and then they would pick it up, do the, the, the analysis, write the results back, and we repeat that until we're, we're done. The genetic algorithm will look at the results, choose the best, mutate, create another generation, and we keep going and we keep going until we either converge on a solution or we say, okay, enough iterations, we're done. We write a tombstone and we finish. And we can do this because we have in-house expertise in cloud. And as a research center, traditionally a very wireless-based research center, we've evolved our mix of people in our research environment to include a lot more computer scientists and data scientists and others to take advantage of the computational capability we have in AWS cloud. We're a small research center, so it's great to be able to scale out massively for HPC, but how does one manage costs? We're trying to, to balance a bunch of requirements, so we'd like to evaluate each population member quickly, but to do it cheaply, you'd use a biplane, but really, we, we want something more powerful. But then, if you want to evaluate the whole population quickly, you've suddenly got a complete fleet of very expensive machines, plus the software licenses. So how do we address that? So we did a very simple comparison. We said, okay, let's use a small cluster of powerful workers. And we ended up saying 32 nodes and 96 cores per node. And we compared that with a much larger cluster of smaller workers. We went to the, the full thousand nodes. And we did this as an experiment to see the difference in cost. This is not a full cost optimization exercise. The amount of time it would have taken us to found the exact sweet spot probably wouldn't have been worth the savings we'd have got. So we just did this as an experiment, just to see. Again, we're a very applied research center, just to get some measurements. So what did that look like? So with our small cluster, essentially we went down from designing a surface, a complex surface in months or even up to a year, down to three days. And it cost us for 100,000 runs, which is typical convergence, around you know, 5,000 bucks or so. So that, that was a good result. We then went to the large cluster, and it ran twice as fast, but it cost twice as much. But we're down to answering one question per day now, rather than one per year. So when you've got a large number of instances, the simplest thing to reduce cost, spot pricing. So for this particular instance type, uh, the market price was around 20 cents, so we, we put in a bid price of 20 cents, and sure enough, uh, we've now halved our, we, we've kept the half time, or twice as fast, and we've halved our cost. And of course, we can extend that by just reducing the bid price, although then your software gets more complicated because you have to accommodate the fact that nodes can disappear, uh, appear and disappear. Now, all this was done in six weeks. I have to emphasize that. We created the team, gave them the challenge, they created the framework, negotiated the licenses, ran it to get results. So we didn't have time to really optimize this, but in the last few days, one of the researchers started to experiment. Well, how could we really optimize the scheduling? And so by extrapolation, uh, he figured out that it, essentially we could get it down to of the order of uh, one, uh, five questions per day and a cost of 1,000 bucks per question. At that point, researcher time is no longer the limiting factor. Compute is no longer the limiting factor. Researcher time is the limiting factor. They, the time it takes them to, value, to formulate the problems, evaluate and understand the results are the issue. But a thousand bucks for a question, it just broke through the paradigm that we, we needed. So, to conclude. We've been in the uh, cloud as a science-based organization at the CRC for about two and a half to three years. And we have many examples, uh, many anecdotes, and I'm happy to talk to you over coffee, 
how we can demonstrate how we can accelerate the time to science, the time to discovery uh, using AWS Cloud. We've also discovered that it's relatively easy for some types of uh, computing to, be, to scale them into the cloud to, re again, dramatically reduce the time to discovery. But when I say relatively easy, that's because we have in-house expertise. We've built that in-house expertise to give us the agility we need for science to keep on the forefront, to keep up with all the other research institutions around the world who are working in the similar field. And what we've also discovered that in the field of science, there are very, very few people outside your organization who can, who can actually help you. And it's a, it's a conclusion that you have to build your own expertise. We've also discovered that commercial software providers who are using traditional license models will have to re-examine their license models, and some we know are already in the process of doing that. And the two most common questions I get when I'm talking about science in the cloud is security and cost. And the more I think about cost, the more I realize when people ask me, what's the difference in cost between traditional on-premises and cloud? And I realize it's not the right question. You're no longer talking about apples to apples. We can do things in cloud that we simply couldn't have done in, with traditional methods. In fact, mo we've migrated all our workloads, and now we're, our new workloads are not only cloud native or cloud first, but they're only cloud possible. We do take some effort to be cost effective, as you saw with the experiment comparing the different cluster sizes. But at the end of the day, cloud may cost you more than more traditional on-premises techniques. But <clears throat> in a science research center, your most expensive resources are your scientists. Any additional costs of cloud you may incur to make them more effective and more efficient really just actually in the end makes economic sense. Thank you very much. Wow, hi. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do this. It's <laughs> great. Yeah, I'm, I'm humbled and excited to be here talking to you guys today. And uh, my name is Gavin Burris from uh, Wharton. And I'm here to talk about res uh, adventures in research computing in AWS. And uh, so, who am I? I'm a computer geek, I'm a systems guy, uh, and I'm an enabler. So, and I work in the research computing uh, on, the on the team there, and uh, we help with the entire research process from defining the design to collecting analysis, publication. Uh, and, but for today's purposes, we'll be talking about um, high performance computing and cloud computing. So uh, what is high performance computing? I think we've, uh, we've touched on, on this a lot. It's, uh, it's, it's taking many servers, many commodity pieces, and making them work as a functional whole, uh, kind of the Beowulf tradition of computing. And this can be used for modeling, simulation, data analysis, and it scales. It scales very large. Maybe it's, uh, maybe it, or maybe it's ma many iterations of the same code. And there's a gradient support model there from, from your laptop to your desktop to your department server to your school server to a national level cyber infrastructure. Um, uh, supercomputer, and it, go, and it can go from command line to, to cluster. And so if you, like, what was already mentioned was top 500, you could see some pretty amazing systems at top500.org, and I should also say that while I have your attention, I am an Exceed campus champion, so uh, part of being an enabler, um, uh, Exceed is uh, the NSF-funded national cyber infrastructure, uh, uh, and Exceed, the campus champions are kind of the, the human face of that. So anybody anywhere who maybe needs a bigger resource or who doesn't have access to a resource, you can talk to me, you can talk to your local champion, and you can get on the national level supercomputers with, uh, with a simple grant. Uh, so this is a, a nice little pie chart of what the, the domains look like, uh, on the, the service units, the CPU hours on the national systems. Uh, me being in a business school, I, I fall squarely under the, the umbrella of social sciences. Uh, so, and that, it, that goes into the other, the other category there. And uh, we are, we, we are, we're growing uh, exponentially. I think we're the largest growing uh, section of this pie. And so it's, ex it's exciting times. It's, it's, a, it's an exciting uh, thing to be in right now. So um, to try to solve this growing need, we start looking at clouds. And uh, after you look at them for a while, um, things, you start seeing things. <laughs> and uh, here, let me go back for full effect. <laughs> and not milk that for all it's worth. 
Uh, so yeah, uh, so I don't think I need to explain this. You know, what is cloud? It's you know, it's outsourcing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's renting. It's uh, it's on demand. It's dynamic. And the great thing that I like is it's programmable and it's uh, it, it, it's it's burstable. And you get less fail. You don't have to go to your server room at 3 a.m. and find this waiting for you. So less of this and less of these. Uh, this system on the left is a chassis of our current system, which I'm looking to upgrade and or just get rid of. And the one on the right is the last generation InfiniBand uh, system that was for climate simulation. Uh, I was pretty proud of these. And so you get less of that and more of code and more consoles, which I really like. I, I like that I have my entire environment defined in a nice and tidy Git repository. Uh, it, keep, it, it helps me sleep at night. So. Um, Amazon EC2, they get bonus points for having lots of high performance computing uh, things that, that, that help with what our requirements. Uh, VPCs, uh, they've got special compute optimized instances, they've got IO optimization, uh, custom AMIs, uh, and you can go see that at, at, uh, at slash HPC. So um, this is here uh, to remind me to talk a little bit about that, that more about that code in my Git repository. So I, I'm a big advocate of uh, configuration management. It, it doesn't, I, I'm not gonna, I use Ansible. It, I think that the important thing is that you use something. Uh, and so what I use Ansible for is to set up, uh, I'll do a minimal boot, uh, the system will come online, it'll just be a Linux box. And then the Ansible playbooks will run, and it does all the things that make that server work as part of my environment. All the tweaks, all the fixes, all the gotchas, they're all in this. And, uh, and my team can, can commit to this in the Git repo. And so the great thing about this is I can use the same code to find my on-prem hardware and my cloud instances, my cloud images. So everything is homogenous. So, th so this is a bit of the magic. This is one piece of the magic that makes uh, going to cloud seamless and, and work for our, our environment and gives, us, gives our users uh, a seamless environment, something they don't have to think about, they can just use and they can stay in their workflow. So the instance types, uh, they go away from an Amazon or from micro all the way up to the, uh, we usually typ typically focus on the compute optimized instances and uh, C4, C5s are out now. Uh, and there's GPU instances, and then it, for the border cases, like the big memory problems, um, we, there's the X1 there, which is pretty crazy. Uh, what helps me, I, I really like this site, ec2instances.info. It's like a giant sheet of what instances are where and their capabilities. I highly recommend you check that out. And like I said, uh, for research computing, we typically look at the, the compute optimized types. So deploying these things, there's a, there's a ways to do this. You can you can. Do it from scratch with Python, with Boto, um, and what we're using right now to great effect is Univa Unicloud, uh, which expands on our on Univa Grid Engine, uh, for, formerly SGE. Uh, it's a it's a batch queuing system for 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 distributing our jobs onto our resources and keeping them maximally utilized in a fair fair share environment. Uh, we were previously using a bit of kit called Star Cluster, and uh, there's also a, a, a bit of kit from Amazon called CFN Cluster. So when you're going to cloud, you want to kind of look at these things like hardware, yarn from hardware versus the instances. It's kind of apples and oranges, so you can kind of get like apples and apples if you look at it along like core count or CPU. Uh, and so here you see that like the, for core count, it was basically the a C4 in terms of memory, memory CPU core ratio it was more of the R3s. Uh, and I've been keeping an on, ongoing record of like uh, of, of, of performance of node performance. So right there at the top, the, in the blue, is a, is one node of our current uh, cluster, uh, the high performance computing cluster at Wharton, and uh, that's uh, getting about 366 gigaflops. I run the I run the IBM optimized Linpack, and this is single node performance. It solves dense linear equations, and it and it kind of exercises the system as a whole, the the memory, the the CPU, yeah. And so, and then as a point of comparison, the, the one at the bottom is my laptop. And uh, the red there is the C4, which is probably the, about the closest I could get at the time when I ran this, uh, comparing cloud to, uh, to a local on-prem hardware. Uh, so the C4s were getting uh, 666 gigaflops consistently when I was testing them, so uh, uh, take that how you will. Uh, but so the C5s were getting 777, and uh, we like those numbers. Uh, so we've got, what do we got here? We have uh, the new C5s, uh, the C5 18X large and the C5 9. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're, we're getting better. 
I want, I, want, I want to get on that. I want my code to run on that. I want to be able to get, my, get our jobs done quicker. And uh, yeah, and being able to switch to these instead of being locked to on-prem hardware is, is appealing. So, uh, so let's, talk, let's do stories. Let's do stories. Um, I had a researcher come to me and we have a centrally funded, I'm, I'm fortunate to have a cluster that's centrally funded so it's available at Wharton to all of our faculty and all our PhDs. And so, so I support them. And one of our researchers came to us and said, you know, I've got this code, I've got to run it 500 times. It, each one takes three to four days. This is gonna take months and months and months on the shared resource. It's just, it's just gonna, we're gonna miss our, our publication deadline. So what we did was we ran a uh, start cluster. We picked, uh, we found an instance type that fit well with the, the core count and, and the need of the job. And they were able to finish their job in four days for $568. So that was, that was a big win. We used spot pricing there and it saved them a lot of money. And so I like a good graph. So this is a graph of uh, 512 cores spinning up. It's not a million cores. I'm, I'm very, we're a very small shop in, in comparison, but this is, I really, I, this makes me happy. So spot pricing is great. You get to pay dime on the dollar, and yeah, this is, this is saving your researcher their, their, their budget. So another use case would be GPUs. Uh, we, we had this gigantic rack of GPU servers and uh, uh, PCI Express expansion risers and all this good stuff, and the, and, the, and the toolkits were installed and updated and validated, and we didn't have a lot of users. But, Researchers would go to conferences, they'd come back and be like really excited about GPUs and the, the, new, the new toolkit and I wanna do this and then we give them access to the system and we did get crickets. So they, didn't, they, they realized they didn't wanna refactor their code or it was, it was, it was, it was really taking too much, an, an inordinate amount of time to, to develop code that fit on the system. Uh, but then, you know, lo and behold, along comes a researcher who really does need GPU and they have their workflow all worked out and they're gonna do some TensorFlow stuff. So we had, at that time, retired our GPUs. We didn't have any. So what we did was we just created a queue. We used Unicloud, and we bursted to the cloud using uh, the, the P2, the P2 instances. So that, that saved our bacon and got, got their research done. So our hybrid cl cloud approach is that we have this on-prem hardware. Uh, it's a very traditional high-performance computing system. Uh, and we want to expand that seamlessly. So we we're now using you know, Unicloud. Uh, and it allows us to create queues and we can tag the instances and we can give them to a researcher and what's a really exciting thing is uh, that we can actually get the d detailed billing and with a couple pages of Python code, those tags, it's tagged by owner and project and budget and they get invoiced monthly and it goes on their budget and they can p use as much as they want and uh, yeah, so it's, it, and it's all in one account, which greatly reduces the administrative overhead. So another good graph is, uh, is this a rendering workflow spinning up and running. I just, I like this shark fin shape. And uh, so, so, so this is a seamless transition. Uh, so so the, the, a few pieces that make this happen are the, the Ansible, the, 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 the configuration management that's, that's applied the same on, on prem and in cloud. Uh, and uh, we have VPC, uh, we have VPN links to our VPC, which makes the VPC network in Amazon just another server, server room subnet. It's just, it's just there, it works. I mean, I'll be at a little bit higher latency through our, our, our internet two peering, but it's just another subnet. And uh, so the plumbing that happens there is, is thanks to our core systems and our, our, our Wharton Research Data Services. They got together, they took out some of the bottlenecks and they, uh, they, they optimized our network path for that VPN. Uh, so at Wharton, we have a cloud mandate by 2020, so I'm looking really hard at this. So yeah, this is, uh, this is the plumbing, and uh, we have, I won't get into too much nitty gritty here, but basically it goes from our system through our core routers, through the VPN out to internet too, and uh, we took out some of the, some of the, uh, some of the bottlenecks to optimize that. Uh, so cost comparisons. So this is where it gets interesting. Uh, it used to be the cloud was too expensive, particularly for highly loaded systems. Uh, the calculation I'm doing now uh, compared to our local chassis uh, is that for two chassis of blades, uh, it's, it's basically 328K for over three years. And if we look at the Amazon instances, and this is, uh, this is reserved instance pricing for three year term. Uh, so if we look at slot equivalent, the CPU equivalent, that's about, you know, 450 versus like the flop equivalent is, is less. It's, it's under, under 100, 
300K. So this is starting to look really appealing and it's starting to look like a better investment over a three-year term. I mean, this is not to say your researchers aren't gonna build a cluster and run it for eight years or until you abandon a server room, because this happens. But anyway, over three-year term, this makes a lot of sense. So this is a graph of our CPU, our CPU core count. Uh, look at that, that, that 500 line. Like I said, we're a small shop uh, compared to the million, so that's, uh, that's our constant on-prem. Uh, and you can see we're, we want this, this, this blue line, this load line, to be around there. That, that, means, that means that things are optimally running, things are running smoothly. Uh, so, and then we look at our, our VPC, this is our cloud, and we're bursting to, um, you know, this is, we kind of started out, this is, this is a weak snapshot, and these are just individual researchers running their workflows, and they're able to go up, and they're able to go down, and yeah, we're getting, we're, we're getting it's working well. So over the last year, uh, there it is, the, the five, 500, and there's our load. And this is the, this is the, the, our bursting over the last year. And we're bursting over like multiples of our on-prem hardware. So this is, uh, this is showing me this, this is working. And you can see that the, that, that lower baseline there, that's, uh, that's, this is another success for me, is this, this red line here at the bottom is kind of raised and is at a steady state. Uh, that is departmental servers, uh, these, these random servers that are in the departments. We've, can, we've built trust, we work with the departments, and we're, we're there, and they trust us to be able to have this dedicated thing that's always on, uh, and so they're able to do their own, they have their own dedicated resource, which is still part of our centralized system, so they have a, uh, an integrated playground to play with. Uh, that's, that's, yeah, it, it gives them a place where they can share and do all their work together uh, in the integrated environment. So yeah, the departmental server replacement was, uh, is better than the one-off research box. And we, uh, this was a successful the pilot with our, research, our real estate department, and uh, we've, to incentivize them not building clouds under all their desks, like we used to do with not building servers under everybody's desks, we've been giving them a 40% discount and our white glove service treatment. And the other piece of this was the tag billing I, I mentioned briefly. Uh, so with a couple pages of Python code, I can grab all of those tags and I can send out an invo invoice to email to the business administrators with the budget numbers and everybody's happy. And they can see their, their, their cost utilization. And so conclusions, so yeah, the cloud is great for us uh, because it's burstable, it gets those jobs done, it help, helps us meet publishing deadlines, it accommodates outliers like GPU and big memory, uh, and it's a path forward. So this is not the Godzilla that's gonna destroy everything as you know it. I find this very much as it's less stack racking and stacking and cabling and more code in your, in your Git repo, which I find really, uh, it, it just, it works for me. And so we're also thinking about offloading lower priority jobs and freeing up the premium on-prem hardware. So this is something I'm playing with right now too. And versus local, I mean, local still has a place in research computing, especially if you have a high latency, I mean, a, a low latency uh, network code that you need to run. Uh, but so for us, the hybrid approach is the way that we're going and it's, it's, it's full of win. Um, thank you for your time and attention.